Hello everyone, welcome to the Sad Crime Channel. Today I'd like to present to you the story of a family who led a life that many can only dream of. Today's story took place in Fresno, a city located in the state of California, United States. However, this American dream came to an end in 1992. What happened then? Join me in listening to the story of the Yule family. Dale Yule was a 59-year-old prosperous businessman who lived with his family. However, it wasn't always smooth sailing for him. Dale was born in 1932 during the Great Depression in the United States. From a young age, along with his siblings, four brothers and a sister, they had to work on their father's farm. They all knew the value of hard work. When World War II broke out, Dale watched with fascination as planes flew over the farm, sparking his interest in these machines. The boy dreamed of becoming a pilot someday, and when he turned 18, he left home and moved to the city of Oxford to study aeronautical engineering at the local university. After completing his education, he joined the United States Air Force, where his childhood dream came true, and he learned how to pilot aircraft. In 1957, at the age of 25, he met a woman whom he started dating and with whom he envisioned a future. Glee had been working for the CIA as a translator for several years, which required her to travel to Argentina for some time. However, this didn't negatively affect their relationship, and upon her return from South America, Dale and Glee got married. Around the same time, after several years in the Air Force, Dale concluded that being an engineer didn't captivate him as much as planes, so he decided it was time for a change. He began working for a company selling small aircraft. The clients of this company were mainly farmers, whom Dale also taught the art of piloting. It was quite a lucrative job with high sales commissions. However, at one point, the owner of the company where Dale worked was arrested and sentenced to a long prison term. This presented Dale with the opportunity to take over the business and earn even more money. Instead of being an employee, Dale could open his own company selling airplanes, which of course meant higher earnings. He was well aware of this, so he didn't hesitate for a moment. And it was the right decision. From that moment on, his company continued to grow, bringing in substantial profits. In Dale's personal life, things were also going quite well. In 1967, the first child of the couple was born, a girl named Tiffany. And four years later, a boy named Dana was born. The children were somewhat spoiled by their parents. Glee didn't come from a poor family. But Dale, remembering his own childhood, did everything so that his children wouldn't have to go without anything. The company thrived, earning more and more, and Dale could afford for Tiffany and Dana to have everything they desired. He and his wife didn't flaunt their wealth. Although they owned a large house and two holiday cottages, one by the sea and one in the mountains, and their bank accounts held huge sums of money, their wealth was estimated at $8 million. They tried to dress modestly in their daily lives, without excessive jewelry or designer clothes. The same couldn't be said for their younger child. Dana had always been fascinated by money. He wanted everyone to know immediately that he wasn't a poor man. He adored his parents' money, but he wasn't as positively inclined towards hard work. His father had achieved everything on his own, and it didn't bother him that he could use his father's money without bothering with work. However, he liked to present it in a completely different way to others. Dana, who from an early age was known for not always telling the truth and had a knack for fantasizing about various topics, told his college friends that it was thanks to his entrepreneurship that he could afford all these expenses. Supposedly, his investments in the stock market and other ventures made him the owner of a company at the age of 21 with an annual income of almost $3 million. His outfit only confirmed that he was already a businessman. He always appeared at university in an expensive suit and drove the latest model of Mercedes. Of course, his parents bought him that car. They also gave him $800 pocket money per month. His mannerisms meant that the boy didn't have many friends. Most people didn't believe his stories and didn't want much to do with him. But his lies extended beyond the circle of college friends, and one day, an article appeared in the local newspaper about a young, very entrepreneurial businessman. When his father read all the made-up things about Dana, he was very upset. 
He was ashamed of his behavior, embarrassed that his son could stoop to something like this. He himself hadn't achieved anything, and yet attributed his father's accomplishments to himself. Dale was so angry with him that he informed him that after finishing his studies, which were due to be completed in 1992, he would stop financing his son. Dana will eventually have to take care of his finances himself. Eventually, he'll be able to demonstrate the entrepreneurship he's been telling everyone about. On April 21, 1992, Juanita Avenita, who was responsible for cleaning the Ewell family's house, stood at their doorstep. She rang several times, but no one answered. Juanita was convinced that the owners should be home that day. She knew they had spent the weekend at their seaside home, but it was already Tuesday, and they should have been back by then. Juanita had worked in that house for many years. The Yules trusted her, so she had her set of keys and knew the alarm code. She unlocked the door, and the first thing that surprised her was that the alarm didn't go off. It had happened before that she came to clean when no one was home and every time the alarm was on. The Yules always remembered to set it. When she entered, she noticed that the house was in terrible disarray. She proceeded to the kitchen and found Tiffany lying on the floor. She wasn't moving and there were traces of blood around her. With horror, Juanita left the house. She had to notify the police as quickly as possible. But when she stepped outside, she came across a man standing in front of the house. It was one of the neighbors who had come to check if everything was all right with the Yule family. Dana asked him to do so. He had been staying with his girlfriend at the seaside cottage all the time. He was concerned that he couldn't contact anyone from his family, so he asked the nearest neighbor to check if anything had happened to them. When Juanita mentioned Tiffany's body in the kitchen, they immediately called the police, who upon arrival discovered not one but three bodies in the house. The same fate that befell Tiffany also befell her parents. Traces of a single bullet were found on the bodies of Tiffany and her father, while Glee was shot three times. Dana, the only survivor, was immediately contacted. He was far from home and unaware of what had happened to his family. Only he could provide the police with more information. The 21-year-old, upon returning to Fresno, testified that on April 19th, Easter Sunday, he spent the day with his parents and sister at the seaside. That day, his family was supposed to meet his girlfriend and her parents. After lunch, Glee and Tiffany got into their Cadillac and set off for home. Meanwhile, Dale flew to his holiday cottage by plane and was returning home the same way. Since they left, he hadn't had any contact with them. Dana had no idea who could have wanted to harm his family. Dale was a businessman known for his determination, but he had no enemies. Glee worked for the CIA, but that was many years ago. Later on, she was a teacher, and for the past few years she had been a homemaker, volunteering in her spare time. She was very well liked by the people who knew her. It would be hard to find a single person who would wish her harm, but someone did. And as usual in such situations, the person who gained the most from the victim's deaths is suspected. In this case, the only person who survived and who would inherit the entire estate was Dana. However, he had an alibi. He wasn't in his hometown at that time. He was at his holiday home located 300 kilometers from home, which his girlfriend and her parents could confirm. It just so happened that this girl's father was an FBI agent, which made his alibi confirmed by that man even more credible. Investigators closely examined Glee and Dale's house. There were no signs of forced entry. All the windows and doors were untouched. Everything looked as if the intruder had entered without any problems. Did they know the alarm code? The whole house was in chaos, suggesting a robbery motive. However, not much was missing from the house. A bit of jewelry and a few bills from Dale's wallet. Several items were arranged on the bed sheet, but the intruder or intruders didn't take them. The only things missing from the house were a few bullets from the packaging, which Dale kept in his nightstand, and one of the pistols. Dale had a collection of firearms, and apart from that one, the rest were untouched. It was a bit suspicious because one would think that would be the first thing the intruders might want to take with them. Later investigation revealed that the missing bullets had been used to kill Dale and his family. However, the stolen pistol wasn't used. Analysis of the recovered bullets indicated that a completely different weapon was used. 
The person who broke into their home came with their own pistol, but without ammunition, knowing that exactly what they needed would be in Dale's bedroom. What's the likelihood that a random person would have such information? Probably none. Investigators were increasingly convinced that Dana was responsible for the murder, but they had no evidence against him. His behavior raised many doubts. When the evidence collection at the crime scene concluded, they could have let him back into the house. He didn't seem bothered by the sight of where all his loved ones had died. The sight of blood on the walls or floor didn't faze him. What mattered most to him at that moment was who would cover the costs of the damage to the house's furnishings incurred during the investigation. There was no sign of mourning in his behavior after losing his family. There was no sadness even during the funeral. The family of the deceased was very shocked by Dana's behavior, who acted as if nothing had happened, as if he were at another party. He told jokes, complimented various women's outfits. This is not how a young man behaves who has just lost his father, mother, and sister. Moreover, despite not lacking money, the coffins he bought for his loved ones were the cheapest he could find. He also didn't decide to buy a vase to leave flowers at the grave. He already knew then that he wouldn't be appearing at the cemetery too often, if at all. However, he was very interested in when Dale's and Glee's will would be opened. It was immediately apparent that money was what mattered most to him. Dana probably thought that after becoming the sole heir, he would quickly become a millionaire, which had always been his dream. However, he didn't realize one thing. When his parents noticed his attitude towards money and after an article appeared in the press that Dale found so embarrassing, they decided to change the will. Since Tiffany was deceased, he was the sole heir, but he wouldn't receive the entire estate right away. Dale and Glee established a trust fund and until the age of 25, he would receive income from the company, funds needed for his education and current needs. After turning 25, Dana would receive all the income earned by the company, but he wouldn't have access to the funds in the account yet. Only after turning 30 would he receive half of Dale's and Glee's estate, and five years later, the remaining part. This meant that he would have to wait another 14 years to have access to all his parents' money. Dana's uncles, who were with him when the will was read, had never seen him so angry before. He only hit the table with his fist and shouted, How could my father do this to me? It was clear that he didn't expect such a turn of events. His behavior seemed so suspicious to Dale's brothers that they decided to inform the police about it. Throughout the investigation, Dana was the main suspect in the murder of his family. But since other people confirmed his presence in a completely different place, and he himself, to confirm this, showed two receipts from shops located 300 kilometers from home, how could he have done it? The only solution that came to the investigators' minds was to hire someone to do it for him. They questioned all the neighbors, but no one saw anything suspicious. One of the neighbors heard strange noises coming from the Yule house on Sunday between 5 and 6, but they definitely weren't the sounds usually heard when a firearm is used. Investigators suspected that on that day, the assailant used a silencer. It was another thing that confirmed their suspicions. It wasn't a burglary that didn't go according to plan, but a planned murder. They decided to take a closer look at Dale's son. The police went to his college in Santa Clara where they found out that his closest friend was Joel Radovchich. He was the complete opposite of Dana. Quiet and shy, he liked to spend his free time in the comfort of his room, indulging in his passion, computer games. However, when the investigators decided to talk to him, what surprised them first was the fact that Joel immediately asked if they were going to arrest him. If you have nothing to hide, why would you ask such a question? It seemed strange, so Joel was immediately put on the list of suspects. During the conversation, he admitted that he did indeed hang out with Dana, but their acquaintance was limited to school meetings. They didn't have any contact outside of it. But that wasn't true. The police who began observing Joel noticed that he often contacted Dana, using either a payphone or a pager each time. A few weeks after the murder, Joel even moved into his house and when Dana finished his studies, they lived there together. Neither of them was bothered by the fact that the house hadn't been cleaned yet and still bore traces of blood. 
Dana even invited one of his friends to the house, asking if he was curious about what the living situation looked like after such a murder. Strange behavior for a grieving person. The investigators doubled and tripled their efforts to find something that would confirm their suspicions. They were convinced that Dana and Joel had something to do with the murder, but couldn't find any evidence of it. No fingerprints or DNA were found at the crime scene, which was a significant obstacle in the investigation. The only thing the police managed to find was yellow fluorescent fibers on the victim's clothing. No one could explain where they came from. Both Dana and Joel were under constant surveillance, and the police saw that the lives they led were not modest. Although Dana didn't yet have access to his parents' entire estate, they were insured for a considerable amount, and Dana received the money after their death. It didn't constitute part of the inheritance, so he received it in full. He also sold all his mother's furs, but it still wasn't enough for him. So he decided to withdraw money from his grandmother's account, who had Alzheimer's and was in a nursing home. He withdrew about $400,000 from her account, leaving only enough money to pay for the facility where she was located. Thanks to all this money, Dana could buy himself a small plane, pay for himself and his friend's flying lessons, and both could live comfortably without worrying too much about work. Dana tried to take over his father's duties, but he didn't actually know anything about the job, and in his case, it was limited to sitting in the office and talking to friends on the phone. However, the investigators didn't give up and wanted to bring the case to a close at any cost. Knowing that Dana and Joel communicated using a pager, they cloned Joel's pager, and from that moment on, every time he received a message, the same message appeared on the cloned pager held by the police. Usually, after receiving a message, he went to a phone booth and called Dana. The police managed to eavesdrop on most of these conversations. Joel wasn't discreet. He didn't pay attention to what was happening around him. He didn't notice the policeman pretending to use the second phone, the man who was eavesdropping and recording his conversations. As a result, the investigators learned about the $250,000 he was to receive from his interlocutor, as well as about trips abroad. However, the most important information the police obtained was when they checked Joel and learned that even before the murder, he ordered several books, but not to the address where he lived, but under the name Jack Ponce. That name meant nothing to the investigators. They had never heard of it before, so they decided to take a closer look at this person. It turned out that he had been Joel's friend for many years, and among the books he ordered, one contained instructions on how to make a homemade silencer for a pistol. When Jack was questioned, he admitted that he had previously owned a gun exactly like the one used to kill the Yule family. Unfortunately, he no longer had it because it was stolen from him. The investigators didn't believe his words. However, thanks to the gathered information, an exact same silencer was built using halved tennis balls. It turned out that it left exactly the same fibers found on the victim's bodies. They were fibers from tennis balls. When Jack was questioned again and all this information was presented to him, he got scared that he might be accused of participating in the murder, which could even result in the death penalty, and he decided to make a deal. In exchange for the assurance that no charges would be brought against him, he decided to tell everything he knew about the murders. The gun he previously discussed with the police wasn't stolen. Jack sold it to Joel, but a few days later, Joel returned it, saying he should get rid of it. He admitted then that he killed Dana's family. He talked about the preparations for the murder, about how he shaved his whole body so as not to accidentally leave any DNA in their house. He went to the Yule house on Sunday early in the morning while it was still dark. He didn't want any of the neighbors to notice him. He had a key to the house, knew the alarm code, so it wasn't too complicated part of the plan. He took the bullets from Dale's bedside table and, after staging a burglary, lay down on the spread plastic sheet and waited for the family to return from the sea. Tiffany was the first to enter the house. She didn't notice him, and as soon as she passed the spot where he was, Joel aimed the gun at her head and pulled the trigger. Glee heard something happening in the kitchen, and when she noticed Joel, she started running, but the he caught up with her and killed her. She was the only one who saw his face, 
and since she knew he was Dana's friend, she must have suspected that her son was responsible. Dale, who returned from the sea by plane, arrived home half an hour later. As soon as he entered the house from the garage, a bullet pierced his body, and he fell dead to the ground. For certainty, Joel checked the pulse of all the victims. However, he couldn't leave the house immediately. He had to wait until it got dark to slip away unnoticed. Dana couldn't do it himself because he realized that as the only surviving member of the family, he would immediately become a suspect. Therefore, he had to ensure himself a solid alibi, and Joel had to do the dirty work, which no one would associate with Dana's family's death. In exchange for getting rid of the whole trio, Dana promised to share his estate in half with him. Joel believed he would become the owner of four million dollars. Jack Ponce showed the investigators where he buried the gun barrel. After Joel told him to get rid of it, he disassembled it into parts and left it in various places. It was cleaned, and several bullets were fired from it to check the traces left on them. They matched perfectly with the traces on the bullets found at the crime scene. And finally, in 1995, after three years of investigation, Dana and Joel could be arrested. They managed to evade justice for three years. But when the trial began in 1997, during which Jack Ponce testified against them, they finally received the punishment they deserved. They managed to avoid the death penalty, because in Dana's case, one person was against it. And in Joel's case, two people disagreed with such a sentence but both received a triple life sentence without the possibility of parole. Dana maintained his innocence and his love for all members of the family until the very end. Today, he is 53 years old and serving his sentence in the protective housing unit of California State Prison, Corcoran, along with other murderers requiring isolation from the general prison population. That's the end of this story. Thank you for listening to it until the end.